allowing divine intervention copyright Richard Dots 2014, first Kindle edition, introduction why write a book about divine interventions, if you picked up this book hoping to read dramatic stories of parting skies, singing angels and objects falling from the sky, then this book is not for you. If you have always thought that divine interventions only happen some of the time to certain people, read, people who are particularly religious or spiritual, you may again be disappointed, but fortunately not for long six after years of being on and off the spiritual path, I have realized one fundamental truth, and it is this, the universe is always ready to intervene on our behalf, we just need to step aside and let it do its magic. The unwavering presence and support of the universe is always there, even though physical appearances may suggest otherwise. This magic doesn't even have to be invoked through magical spells or incantations. It is not reserved for the select few who have proven themselves worthy enough for it. Universal energy is available in equal amounts for everyone. It is eternal, omnipresent and always there. We just need to become aware of this truth and then all of a sudden, Life starts to flow for us, where previously there were trouble and difficulties. 7. Now everything just snaps into place, where previously there were hindrances and barriers. Now everything just magically dissolves on its own. I'm willing to wager that you would also have experienced one or two seemingly miraculous events in your own life, even though you may not have been adhering to a particular spiritual path or practice back then. Almost everyone I've spoken to can recount the one or two special instances in their lives, when things magically straightened themselves out without any effort on their part. While you may not have thought much of these occurrences back then, recognize today that they are truly divine interventions. The divine needs no help, ate from you, and is always available and ready to help you. This leads me to the premise of this book which you're currently holding in your hands, hopefully. By the time you have finished reading this short book, you too would know in your hearts of hearts that divine interventions are truly possible for each and every one of us. In fact, I hesitate to even call them interventions because the word itself suggests someone going out of their way and helping us at that last moment. But for the lack of a better word, divine interventions are not reserved for the 11th hour. They can happen at any time we allow them to. They are always happening. 9. Whether we are aware of it or not, your life is divine, you are an extension of the divine, and so the universe is always gently guiding you on your highest path whether you know it or not. It may be difficult to see divinity at work when we look at a short window of the lives we have led, but look at it from a higher perspective, and a broader view, and even the most cynical skeptic will come to agree that something must have been guiding them along the way. I am often amazed when I look back at myself just 10 years ago, and at the wonderful events that have transpired since then, I encourage you to do the same, bring yourself back to a point in time, let's say about 10 years ago, the specific point, 10 does not matter, and stand in your own shoes back then, would you have expected the ensuing 10 years to turn out as such, would you have been able to direct or plan your life down to the smallest detail? using all of your intellect and mental faculties, such that things turned out the way they eventually did, even the most well-meaning and capable individual would not be able to foresee exactly how his life would turn out. Despite our best planning, life has other plans for us. These other plans do not refer to some kind of karma or fatalistic outcome due to our 11 past lives or deeds, but rather, they refer to the divine guidance and nudges that we are constantly receiving from the universe. Despite our best efforts at planning, our physical perspectives prevent us from seeing the full picture. Hence the divine is always gently trying to nudge us and getting us to see the fuller, greater picture. Your fulfillment in life is therefore proportionate to your ability to see through the eyes of source. From the perspective of the divine, as I write this book, my dear cousins have just given birth to their first child. Oh how much I enjoyed watching the baby gently asleep in its cradle, feeling the rush of universal energy flow through me as I held the baby in my arms. I see the baby as a 12th kindred spirit, so allowing of source energy, 
but don't ever forget that this source energy is just as equally and readily accessible by us, as it is by the baby, or by any one of the religious masters that have roamed this earth. Jesus has repeatedly told his followers that, whatever I do, you can do too. What he was saying was more than just words of encouragement, for he was speaking the universal truth. The truth is that we all have access to this universal energy that we can tap into and allow to flow through us at any moment in time, because a baby has just emerged into the physical world and has not received any of the social conditioning that comes with the process of education and interaction. 13 With others, it is still very much connected to its divine source. Notice how the baby doesn't even worry about how it will get its next meal, or how its needs will be taken care of, it just is and knows, lying there peacefully in its cot this is not to be mistaken as simple mindedness, instead, the baby has such profound faith and trust in the universe that all its needs will be met and taken care of, true enough, adults around a baby often rush to meet its every desire at the slightest cry. Divinity works through us to ensure that a newborn baby is provided for, the divine always has its own plans, if this happens for infants, why can't the same hold true for adults as well, that's because as adults, we have been conditioned, 14 and led to believe that we need to fend for ourselves, that the world out there is not a good place, that there are lots of people wanting to take advantage of us if we are not careful. This is how we usually end up in a self-perpetuating cycle of lackful and limited thinking. This pattern of limited thinking can be readily recognized once we become aware of how these self-sabotaging thought patterns work. I know of a woman who constantly displayed defensive and competitive behavior towards anyone who worked with her, thus alienating all her co-workers. She perceived anyone who worked with her as a threat to her position. It was preposterous that she would behave in such a manner, 15 since she had already reached the upper limits of her career path and could technically not be promoted any further. Her job was thus secure, yet her own limited perception made it seem otherwise, leading to her outer directed defensive behavior. I would not be surprised if she indeed loses her job in the near future, not due to anyone who is trying to get her but because of her own self-sabotaging thoughts and belief patterns. Once you rid yourself of your false negative beliefs, your results and experiences in the real world will change, but until you direct your energy in the right manner, your outer reality stays the same. 16 How to tell if your beliefs have really changed if you have not changed your actions, you have not changed your beliefs. I once read this quote that made me sit up and notice. I've always thought that it was sufficient to merely change one's inner thoughts and beliefs, but the true litmus test of whether you have successfully done so is whether you manage to change your outer directed actions instead. If you claim to have changed your inner beliefs by repeating affirmations and using strong, forceful words of demonstration, but still engage in the same fear, 17 based, outer directed actions, you would be deluding yourself. As mentioned in my previous books, most notably Ban Manifestation Secrets, the universe picks up on all your thoughts and beliefs perfectly 100% of the time. You may deceive everyone around you but not the universe. The universe always knows your truest, innermost feelings and beliefs about a subject. Therefore, even if you are acting as if, trying to fake it till you make it, if you feel like a loser or a cheat inside of yourself, that's what the universe is going to pick up on and give you more of, the truths about faking it till you make it. 18. It took me a long time to understand this principle. In my early days of studying the success literature, I constantly read about the importance of faking it till you make it. If you fake it long enough, soon it will come true for you, they said. For example, if you visualize and feel that something is yours long enough or act as if something is yours for long enough, it will eventually come true in your reality, but that is just half of the story, until you realize the other half, you are not receiving the full understanding, faking it till you make it only works if the change in outer directed actions causes forces you to change your inner limiting 19 beliefs, for example, if giving away your last dollar forces you to surrender fully to the universe and let go because you have no other options, 
then in that moment of letting go, you would have changed from believing in lack to an empowering belief of universal providence. The universe would then respond accordingly to your true feelings. If giving money away to a charity truly causes you to feel rich on the inside, then once again you will be richly provided for through unseen means. But if you give to charity begrudgingly, just because you want to act as if, but still bemoan the money given away on the inside, guess which is the universe responding to, your outer directed, 20 actions or your innermost thoughts and feelings. The answer is obvious, acting as if can sometimes cause a strong, nagging sense of dissonance between who you really are inside, and the person you are trying to be outside, that's why in my other books, I often advocate a simpler way, stop trying so hard, stop trying to make things happen forcefully, adopt a cheerful, playful, indifferent attitude of play, stop trying to care about how things will turn out, ironically, that is also when things will turn out the best for you, but remember you cannot fake indifference, you cannot fake a carefree attitude, you must truly, truly, truly feel it in your bones, you must truly believe in it, 21, that's what we are going to be talking about in greater detail over the next few chapters, I'm going to give you a road map by which you can allow your good to come into your life without any of the forcefulness effort or strain that has been so familiar in the past, once you experience this new way of living, you will never want to go back to experiencing the old, being lazy versus trusting in the universe I was once explaining this concept to someone and he retorted, isn't that a very lazy way to live having to depend on the universe for everything well first, you are 22 not depending on anyone for anything, there is no one out there that is withholding your good from you. God is certainly not withholding your good from you, no matter what images you hold of this presence, perhaps my friend perceived the act of having to ask the universe for everything as a sign of weakness, but that would be a misinterpretation of these universal laws, these teachings are not about asking, asking means you want something which you do not yet have, and perceive it as lacking in your life, instead, these teachings are about recognizing that what you want is already here and developing an awareness of the good that is already here, when you become aware of the good that is already here, you make, 23 space for miracles in your life, you don't have to ask because you were never separate from the universe to begin with, you are a part of the miracle, in each of the chapters that follow, I'm going to weave these principles alongside stories, so that they can be slowly absorbed and picked up by you, the reader, it may take more than a single reading, but my focus has always been on the integration of these principles into one's life. Nothing happens until you truly integrate these principles into your life. I know of many people who have read tons of self-help books and are able to quote from these books at will but still little is happening in their lives. Why is that so? They have not truly integrated the material, 24 into their lives. They know what they are reading about at an intellectual level, at the rational level. It makes sense and seems logical, but they have not become the essence of the very knowledge they are trying to grasp. Become these principles you're reading about. Don't just read about them, become them, live them as part of your lives. Remember that your beliefs have not changed if your actions have not changed. Until then, your outer reality and results will not change. To help you understand the concepts better, I have added real life anecdotal examples to each of the chapters which apply the spiritual principles taught. One common objection raised by students is this can't 25 possibly apply to my case, or it sounds fine, but my problem is too serious for this. Once you see how powerful these universal principles and spiritual laws are, you will soon realize that there is no problem too big for the application of these principles. In fact, I would add that the bigger the issue at hand, the more you have to rely on these principles, so flip the page and start becoming the change you want to be in this world, I wish you all the very best, chapter 1 your good is always present here and now your good is always present here and now, and you do not have to go anywhere else to find it, realizing this truth will save you lots of time and trouble, and also from much disappointment and wasted effort. 
I know a friend who sold all his possessions and bought a one-way plane ticket to a place he perceived as favorable for entrepreneurship. He said that statistically, it is a place with the highest level of entrepreneurship in 27 the country. From my conversations with him, he considered his previous home too stifling and restrictive. He was constantly speaking about how he was held back from doing great things, and yet, for every reason he gives that holds him back, hundreds, and possibly thousands, of others have achieved success under the exact same conditions. I hear of others who have done the same in pursuit of spiritual truths, going in search of the Holy Land. All of them thought they had to go to some special place to find it. It is never about your physical location. 28 Of course, some succeed in eventually getting what they want, but the vast majority return empty-handed and are still searching. Those who eventually find what they want may attribute their success to being at a particular place at a particular time. But it is never about the physical location, it is always about one's consciousness. Being in that place elevated them to the higher level of consciousness necessary for the attainment of their goals. But don't even make the mistake of thinking that it is ever about being in the right place at the right time. They could have elevated themselves to the consciousness at any place. Every place is the right place for your good. 29. There is no right place or right time. Every place is the right place, even where you're currently sitting or standing on. So start right now, from where you are, with what you have. You already have everything you need. You are in control of your body, of your mental faculties, and that is all you need to get started. Herein lies an important spiritual principle your good is not tied to any specific time or place. You do not need to go somewhere, or do something to receive your good. All the good that you have access to is already available here, at this moment, right where you are. The universe does not dole out more good at a certain point in space or 30 time, and then withdraw that good from out there's at another physical location or time. This would be absurd. The universe does not take from one to give to another. Recognizing this spiritual truth will allow you to transcend limited thinking, for another person's good can never limit your own. Universal substance is always equally present, here and now. Therefore no matter what your current circumstances are, I wouldn't blame a current physical conditions. I wouldn't say, oh, once I get out of this situation, things will get better. Maybe they would or maybe they wouldn't, but it is not dependent on the place or setting. The 31 one thing it just depends on is your consciousness change your consciousness, and your life will change therefore. If you are able to change your consciousness, your outer circumstances will change in an instant. You will still wake up in the same bed in the morning, in exactly the same room, but yet things will no longer be the same for you. Whatever problems were previously perceived would have magically straightened themselves out, such that there is no longer an issue. I can't tell you how many times I have experienced this in my own life. I would. 30 to often think I was in some kind of predicament, and brood about an issue for a few days. Of course, there was a lot of worrying associated with all that thinking, as I tried using all my intellect to solve the problem or to find a solution. Eventually, depending on the amount of sheer willpower I had at that time, I would invariably let go of the problem. In my early days, I did this unwillingly. I let go of the problem only when I exhausted all possible options, when I had no other choice, but now I have learned the wisdom of letting go right from the very beginning, we are just not made to worry, nothing good ever comes out of worrying, a very powerful affirmation to use before you sleep, 33, I have often gone to sleep, turning the problem over to the universe, Florence Govelshin teaches a very powerful affirmation one can use for this. When I wake up in the morning, I'll know exactly what to do depending on your individual preferences. You may choose to adopt this affirmation for your own use but as far as my experiences have been, no affirmations or even physical words are necessary. All that is needed is a willingness to let go of the perceived problem. How can there be any problems when universal good is always equally present in every point of time and space? Any problems thus stem from our perceptions, consciousness, 
and a 34 correction of our consciousness will bring about a seeming correction of the problem. Nowadays, this is what I do when I am faced with an issue that confronts me, and it is what I sincerely recommend to you too. I skip the worrying part and go straight to letting the universe handle it. No problem is too big for the universe by the way. These steps I'm about to share work for any problem. Once again, don't fall into the trap of thinking that it does not apply for your problem. It applies for all problems you face, be it your finances, health, or relationships. Chapter 2A3 Step Approach to Solving Life's Problems First I detach myself from the problem and look at it objectively for what it is. Don't try to turn away from it or avoid it, but rather devote some time to studying the problem from all angles and perspectives. Look at it separately from yourself. Take the perspective of a curious onlooker and examine it from every angle, just as a scientist would. The key word here is objectivity. Separate yourself from the issue and look at it 36 from the eyes of a third party. Do not bring yourself into the mental picture. Instead, see it from the outside. Looking in, this first step satisfies our rational need to ponder the problem we have at hand. Second, ask yourself what are the possible consequences? What is the worst that can possibly happen? I wouldn't shun away from listing the worst things that can happen. Don't worry, just listing the worst possible outcomes will not make them happen as is often erroneously believed by new students of the law of attraction. Thinking about it once wouldn't make it happen, although chronically worrying about it could turn it into reality, but that's not what I am. 37 Asking you to do All I am suggesting here is that you list the worst possible outcomes. A few realizations may occur once you list the worst possible outcomes. First, you may come to realize that the worst possible outcome isn't as bad as you think or feared. It may even be something which you can accept. It is not going to destroy you as previously thought, when all the fear thoughts were swimming around in your head. Very often, I find that merely asking myself for the worst possible outcome calms me down, because it puts the issue into perspective. For each outcome you have listed, ask yourself the following question. How true is this? Is this really the only 38 possible outcome? I can tell you in my years of doing this exercise that the answer every single time is no. Every time I ask this question, the truthful answer is always, no, this is not the only possible outcome. There are many other better, more positive outcomes that are equally possible. Whenever you restrict or limit yourself to seeing only the worst possible outcomes, you are tormenting yourself unnecessarily. You are also miscreating using the powerful laws of the universe. You could just have easily used your mental faculties to think about an equally positive outcome, but you spend all your energy thinking about something negative and unwanted instead. Once you take this second step, you begin to 39. See the fallacy of your thinking. Your thinking has been scaring you unnecessarily by showing you only the options that you fear the most. These are not necessarily the most rational options, but the options we have been conditioned to believe. As always, these are not the only options. There are an infinite number of more positive outcomes that can emerge from the situation, if you let it. Finally, the third step is just to let the problem go. You have pondered it for long enough. You have thought about the worst possible outcomes and realized that they are not the only possible outcomes. You have realized the futility of thinking about it. What use does thinking about the situation? 40 do? It does nothing. And so you let it go to the universe. This is done through a conscious decision to stop worrying about it. Adopt a carefree attitude and say, if it has to happen, it has to happen. If it comes to pass. It comes to pass. Saying these words does not mean that your unwanted outcomes will come to you faster. Instead, they signify a sense of letting go of the fear-based emotional charge. When you diffuse the emotional energetic charge surrounding any issue, the issue no longer has any hold over you. It no longer has any power over you. The issue dissolves by its own accord, even if outer circumstances seem to remain the same. If you immerse yourself long enough in this state, 
41 Then you leave and wonder why you perceived a problem in the beginning to begin with. As Marianne Williamson writes, a miracle is a shift in perception. May I add that it is a change in your perception, and not the other parties. This perceptual change cannot be forced. It must be realized. Divine Intervention in Action A relationship problem at the workplace Remember the story of the lady I told at the beginning who was constantly competing with and alienating all the people she worked with? This is a true personal experience, and I was at the receiving end of a few, 42 of her deeds. For a time it was truly frustrating. I perceived a problem. I was caught up in the emotional play of it each time she did something that riled me. You know that feeling. So I brought myself through the steps I've just talked about above. First, I pondered the situation objectively. Second, I asked myself what was the worst that could happen. It was in that moment I realized nothing bad could happen to me. Whether or not I engaged in an emotional playoff with this lady had no effect on my work. If I engaged in an emotional playoff, I only ended up making myself worked up and miserable but it would have no effect whatsoever on my work. It was in that moment of 43 going through the steps shared earlier that I realized the folly of my actions. Everything was already whole and perfect the way it was. Whatever the lady did could not affect me, and it was all only an illusion. It was a problem with my perception of the situation. With that realization, my perception shifted. I gave up trying to change the situation. A miracle is a shift in perception. The physical situation is still the same, comprising of me, her, and other people in the office. But something has shifted energetically. The energy patterns are now completely different. Because I am now at peace with the situation and not wanting to fight reality, I changed reality. 44 This is perhaps the most ironic and wonderful lesson one can learn about allowing divine interventions. When you stop trying to change reality, it changes by itself to align with your new understanding. A divine intervention has truly taken place. I did the third step of the process and let go of my need to control her behavior. The moment I did that, everything fell like a house of cards. The whole situation no longer had an emotional charge over me. I began to see ironically the perfection of it all. Whereas a few moments ago I was seeing problems all over the place. I was so distressed I could hardly sleep. What has changed? Nothing but my perception of the situation. She has changed too. She leaves. 45 me alone now. Despite me not sending out any physical signals. Through emails, verbal communications or the likes to indicate my new understanding of the situation. The universe intervenes in truly unique ways for all of us. Dealing with a problem may give you a spiritual insight. I bring this example up because it illustrates two important lessons. One may think we have a strong spiritual understanding, gleaned from reading a spiritual passage countless times. For example, prior to having this experience, I read repeatedly that everything is 46 already perfect, and it is a problem with our own perception when we perceive problems. On a logical level I understood the statement perfectly, but it was not until I was forced to confront an actual problem on my own that I realized what the principle truly meant. Quite frankly, it was difficult for me to accept that my understanding of the problem was causing the problem in the first place. She looked like the whole of the problem. Similarly, it was difficult for my friend to accept that his consciousness was causing his lack of entrepreneurial opportunities not the outer circumstances in his case. And so, through my letting go of wanting to fix the situation, I was allowing divine intervention to take place. In this case, 47 there were no earth-shaking, sky-splitting changes, and yet the issue resolved itself peacefully, in the most beautiful way possible. Most of the divine interventions in your life will be like so. They'll be subtle, but the effect will be profound. You'll know it when you experience it. Do not try to force a particular outcome. Don't try to force a particular intervention or outcome. All too often we pray for a particular outcome to happen, thinking it would solve the problem once and for all. For example in my case, I could have prayed for the lady to leave the place, possibly through some kind of transfer or sacking. 
48 that could have been one possible outcome, and it is one that many people ask for when confronted with similar situations. However, what we think is the best possible outcome for a situation may not necessarily be the best possible outcome of the universe, which always has higher and better plans for all of us. Had I hoped fervently that she would somehow vanish from my life, I would have been praying in vain. The universe reached the most harmonious solution that was the highest and best for all involved. It required no one leaving, and everyone is happy. Why do we sometimes attract problems? 49 One interesting question that arises from this is what all of us had done to attract the situation. I had certainly not been behaving in the same manner as this lady, neither did anyone else in the office. Yet we all found ourselves in the same situation of having to deal with her antics. So from a law of attraction point of view, what happened? Why is it that we attracted someone who was a polar opposite to our own behavior? Doesn't this contradict the universal laws of like attracting like? The answer to this question may hold valuable insights. In the beginning, when I perceived a problem with this lady's behavior and was offended by them, I did indeed through my feelings and vibrational, 50 patterns, attract more of her into my own experience, that was when she ruffled my feathers the most, attraction is energetic and emotional by nature, so no actions really need to be offered by me, however, the moment I made that subtle shift of perception and decided that she could behave in whatever way she wanted, which is really the only logical outcome there can be, for one can never control another. I stopped attracting her energetically, true, she was still there physically, but nothing she did now could affect me in any way, maybe certain things I did would still affect her, but that's based on her own, 51 perception and consciousness, which was no longer relevant to me by then, your well-being then, is thus never dependent on another person, physical time or place, it is only dependent on yourself, when you realize this, you become truly free from any and all limitations, you are free. Chapter 3 How to allow the universe to get through to you Is there anything you need to do to start receiving nudges from the universe? I often receive this question from my readers and friends, who do not yet fully understand the work I'm doing, or they would say something like, I wish the universe could talk directly to me and give me signals, like what it is doing to you all the time to which I would always answer. The universe is talking to you too, all the time, whatever 53 the universe is doing for me, it is also doing for you, there is no separation between any one of us, there is also no separation between us and this universal life force, we are the universe at its essence, divine intelligence substance is always flowing through us at every single point of time and space, as I look back at my life, I can't help but ask the question, where was the universe during those long years when I was suffering, deep in depression and even contemplating suicide? Those days stretched onto weeks and months, with seemingly no help inside for me. Every morning I would wake up, stare at the floor and cry, unable to do much for most of the day. So where was the universe when I needed it the most? 54. I'm bringing up this deeply personal example because I understand that some of you may be going through similar experiences, perhaps not as serious, or even more serious than mine, but you are wondering where the universe is when you need it the most. When I was in that depressed state, I was hoping for the circumstances to change by themselves every single day. Secretly, I held on to the hope that a miracle would happen that would change things overnight. I was hoping for a divine intervention and yet it did not occur. Don't sit and wait for changes outside of yourself. 55 As I look back at that period of my life, I now realize that the universe was equally present in my life back then, as it is right now. This is the first spiritual principle you have to understand, especially if you are going through a perceived rough patch in your life right now. If it is difficult for you to see this right now, then take it from me on the basis of faith, and the truth will reveal itself more clearly in time to come. But the first realization one has to make is that universal power is equally available to you at all times of your life. It is not withheld from you at certain points, and then given in great abundance at certain periods. 
Even in the most stressful periods of our life, the universe is standing, 56 by, ready to intervene. The full force of the universe is available to you at every moment. Meditate on this truth until you understand its essence. How to activate universal help What was causing me back then to not take advantage of these amazing powers of the universe? 4-1 I did not have the knowledge or know how to, as I had not delved into such a deep study of these universal principles. But there is another reason. I now realize that it was an issue with my own perception. I allowed myself to sink into depression because I had perceived certain, and, 57 several, situations in my life as a dead end. I could not see the light at the end of the tunnel. This is probably the reason of most depression, perceiving problems and seeing no humanely possible way in which they can be solved. To make matters worse, I believed in those fear thoughts without questioning them, which can be easily done using the techniques in the previous chapter. One thing led to another, and I was soon depressed, through the power of my own negative thoughts which I saw no way out of. Spiritual teachers often teach that when you perceive imperfection, it is because your own sight is defective, not because there is anything imperfect with the universe. Reading this quote now, I have come, 58 to a perfect realization of what it means. The universe was already perfect back then as it is right now. It has always been and will always be, but my sight back then was defective. I could only see the problems and kept believing in them. I refused to let go of them and entertain the alternatives. Hence the universe had no way to intervene. It had no way of getting through to me. When your mind is constantly overwhelmed with fearful, worrisome thoughts and mind chatter, it is difficult to receive impulses from the universe because so much of your limited attention is spent on entertaining those thoughts. A part of you, the unconscious, is going into overdrive, generating those same thoughts over and over again. Chapter 4 A quick way to test if your thoughts generally benefit you A quick way to test this is to see what thoughts usually surface into your awareness on their own. Are they good, positive thoughts, or are they generally negative? Worrisome ones? I wish I did this exercise in the early days. I did not realize that most of the thoughts that were welling up spontaneously for me back then were negative and 60 worrisome ones. I was so accustomed to having those worrying thoughts in my mind chatter that I came to see them as natural. I thought they were keeping me safe. Having an awareness is the first step towards making a conscious effort to change the outcome. Today however, Unwanted thoughts rarely creep into my awareness. As a result, my mind is filled with happy, positive and light thoughts most of the time. I would say that on average, one to two worry thoughts pass through my mind each day. When it happens, I gently and easily let it go and the thought has no effect on me. I have certainly come a long way as compared to the past, when hundreds of thousands of worry, 61 thoughts pass through my mind each day. So it is certainly possible to rid yourself of fear thoughts. More importantly, when you free yourself from fearful or worrisome thoughts, you are creating a space in which you can receive nudges and signals from the universe. As I wrote in my book What to Do When You Are Stuck, the universe rarely gives you signals when you are sitting around waiting for them, but the universe gives you lots of signals when you are in tune with the flow of things. When you are not sitting around idly waiting for these signals, so get busy doing what you are inspired to do. Immerse yourself in the fun of life and more fun will follow. 62 As a result of keeping my mind clear such that more creative and empowering thoughts can flow through me, I have been receiving nudges from the universe and would like to share some of them with you here. A timely nudge from the universe I was recently in a consultation session with a client which was scheduled from 7 to 9 in the evening. Unfortunately, something cropped up for the client that evening and he requested to end the meeting early at 8 p.m. This has never happened before and it was somewhat of an inconvenience for me since I already had the time blocked out, but I felt an inner nudge too. 63 XE to the request. It soon became clear why this had occurred when I walked to my car. The parking warden had just come around to check all the cars in around that block, something which happened very rarely, and I would have received a parking ticket had I left my appointment at the scheduled time. 
While this is a small example, it shows that nothing is too small or too insignificant for the universe to act on. Leave all the logistics to the universe. It's not your job to figure all the details out. The universe has all the ways and means to ensure that all pieces fit and play out beautifully. Your job is to be in tune with your highest self. Because I was nowhere near the experience of attracting a 64 parking ticket. With my happy and good feelings, the universe brought me out of the situation easily and effortlessly. Asking the universe for small things all too often people say, I don't want to trouble God, the universe, with this, or this is such a small matter, we should not ask God for help. What this implies is that they only rely on universal help for the bigger stuff, and try to handle the small matters themselves. This in itself is flawed logic, since the universe does not discern between small and big requests. Nothing is too small or too big for the universe. The universe treats all 65 requests equally, and energy flows equally to fulfill each of your desires and requests. The perception of a big request is a self-imposed limitation that often leads to unnecessary delays in the manifestation process. Also, implicit in the earlier assumption is that we only have a limited supply of requests. Thus we should not ask frivolously for fear of exhausting our opportunities. Once again, this is a false belief based on limited and lackful thinking. One should not hesitate to boldly ask the universe for everything we truly desire. What you should never ask the universe for. 66 There is only one type of requests in which I advise against asking the universe for. That is when you are making frivolous requests to test whether the law of attraction or any of these spiritual principles work. All too often those who seek to test the universe get nothing in return. It is not that the universe deliberately withholds anything from you, but because an individual with such a mindset usually harbors a deep sense of distrust in the universe. The universe always gives you more of what you offer. Hence if you are feeling a deep sense of distrust and a lack of faith, you will in turn get more reasons to continue believing so. Remember that the universe does not seek to change your mind or 67 persuade you any other way. It just is and gives you more of what you offer. This is also the reason why when I was in a state of deep depression, the universe could not do anything until I made the first move. The universe, as life sustaining as it is, does not seek to control our individual thoughts and actions. It always allows us to be who we are. There is a temptation upon reading a Law of Attraction or Reality Creation book to immediate test it out by asking for a whole bunch of outrageous things. Very often when we examine the attitude of the person doing the asking, it will be one of disbelief and fear. I don't really believe the universe can deliver these things to me, so I am asking to see if I get them. I will only believe if I get these 68 outrageous things I'm asking for it is precisely this mentality that keeps many people trapped. Because once you fall into the trap of wanting to prove something for yourself, you are offering the vibration and feelings associated with disbelief. Part of you wants to be right, while another part of you secretly wants to be wrong. Therefore there is always this inner tension and drama that plays out within yourself that drains you of proper, creative energy. It was not until I resolved this tension within myself that many miraculous things started happening for me. It was only when I truly let go of the need to test the universe in any way that the universe responded to my new beliefs and faith. So don't make the mistake after reading this book of wanting to prove anything wrong. It. 69 keeps you in a self-perpetuated no-results cycle. Instead, recognize that these laws are powerful. Recognize that these laws keep your heart pumping and your body working perfectly. These laws orchestrate everything in the universe to great precision, far greater than any human planner can do. Rest your faith in these laws that they will work for everyone and for you. Once you rest your faith in the perfection of these laws, you are putting yourself in a conducive state to receive miracles into your life. Chapter 5 Spotting Synchronicities in Your Life Here are a few helpful tips to allow the universe to get through to you. First, no matter where you are and what you are doing, make it a point to spot serendipitous and happy events in your life. 
Start with the intention affirmation. I intend to become more aware of how the universe is working for my highest good. Most people tend to dismiss certain events as mere coincidences, or brush them off by saying that those things would have happened anyway. But how can you be so sure? I now know, looking 71 back at the pattern of events in my life that nothing is a coincidence. Make it a point to notice little coincidences and synchronicities in your life when they occur. The more you notice them, the more they'll occur in your life. The term synchronicity was coined by renowned Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung to describe two events that are meaningfully related but unlikely to be causally related. In other words, one event does not cause or directly relate to the other. Going back to my parking lot example, the first event, the client asking me to leave early, and the second event, me avoiding a parking ticket, were unrelated to one another. The client did not. 72 asked me to leave because he knew that a parking attendant was coming around the block. Yet when both events are taken and considered together, a more meaningful interpretation emerges. This is the synchronicity that Jung speaks of. This synchronicity points to greater universal forces at work. When I start to look for synchronicities in my life, I find more and more of them. I begin to realize that the universe is truly responding to my every thought, feeling and action. For example, I may look at a product catalog or website in the morning, and in the same afternoon come across the very same product in the store, literally falling right into my lap for me to purchase, often at a huge discount. 73. Just recently I wanted to subscribe to a technology magazine that I liked but the online subscription form was broken and I emailed the publishers. To my delight, the publishers wrote back saying that their website was indeed down, but they were running a new promotion and would give me a pair of speakers as a gift if I signed up for the two-year package. This opportunity would have been missed had the online form been working normally. I now see these events in my life not as mere coincidences, but as the universe working for my highest good. A skeptic will see these events as mere coincidences, but if you truly think about the odds, they are mind-blowing. You not only 74 need to have the events happening in the right sequence, one after another, you would also need the whole string of coincidences to happen one after another. What are the statistical chances of that? I'm a much happier person, in fact, a very happy person. Believing that the universe is conspiring on my behalf and you should too. Everyone whom I've shared this exercise of documenting synchronicities in their lives with has had miraculous results. They all came back to me a few days later and told me about all the seemingly miraculous things that have happened. Guess what? These synchronicities are already happening all the time in their lives, responding to their thoughts and beliefs. Now they are becoming. 75 more aware of them, through your newfound sense of awareness, you'll have a greater appreciation of these universal laws, which will allow you to experience more fun and exhilarating moments in your life. I now notice that when I look at the photograph of someone and stare at it for a few moments, that the same person usually comes into my life a few days later. This has been a very fun experience for me. For example, I was recently looking at the website profile of someone and reading more about her. Imagine my surprise a few days later when she came into my life, not literally as friends or acquaintances but as someone I saw at the restaurant. All these experiences have convinced me about the power of our 76 thoughts, and these experiences remind me of the great power we have at our hands. I encourage you to play with this and see what you find. Just start from today and affirm. I am becoming more aware of how the universe is always working for my highest good. State that intention, and then release it. There is nothing more you have to do. Go about your daily life. As you do so, let all the events of your life happen naturally. When the second event, the synchronicity, happens, you'll usually get a deep sense of inner knowing. For example, when my online subscription could not go through, I did not think too much about it. However, when I, 77 received the email reply from the publisher offering me the freebies, I had a deep sense of inner knowing and I instantly understood why things had to happen the way they did. 
I suddenly could an instant link between the first event and the second event. I am not advocating that you go around deliberately trying to reinterpret events in your own life. There is no need to do so. When these synchronicities happen, their meaning will be very clear to you, and only for you. You will be filled with a deep sense of inner knowing, which can only be best described as meeting an old friend whom you've not met in a long time, with the feeling that both of you have known each other forever. This sense of knowing is all. 78 You need to rest in the assurance that the universe is always conspiring for your highest good. Chapter 6 Making Space for Divine Interventions In the previous chapter we talked about how you are encouraged to ask the universe for help, guidance, at any point in time, for any type of requests, so long as you are not making use of frivolous requests to test the universe. In this chapter, we are going to talk about asking for divine intervention and help in times of crises, or when the problems of the day seem pressing to you. In other words, what should you do when you need an urgent intervention? 80 The first awareness that you should have when something pressing crops up is this. No matter what the problem may be, the universe always has a solution for it. And by always I mean every single time, with no exceptions. There is no problem that is too big or too small for the universe. You need to understand that no matter what you are facing right now, a solution is always ready to be delivered to you, just that you are not aware of it yet. Knowing that the solution already exists will allay much of your fears and worries, because one of main causes of worry is that there is no possible way to get out of the problem. There may seem to be no straightforward way from our limited human perspectives. But as I've experienced time and time again and share in my book the 81 Magic Feeling, the universe has its own means. I would like to share a story of how I trusted the universe, and how the universe in turn responded beautifully to my trust. In all of these stories that I share in my books, I tend to talk about the universe as another party. However, this is not an entirely accurate representation. The universe is you. The universe is within you. You are the universe. You are universal source energy. You are not separate from the universe. Thus when I say that the universe responded beautifully, know that I am using these words more out of convenience and ease of exposition, rather than implying that the 82 universe is a separate being outside of ourselves. There was once I had to run some errands but it was raining heavily, making it difficult for me to drive. Normally I would wait till the rain subsided. But an inner nudge told me to go ahead and make the trip that day. Looking out of the window, the rain was indeed heavy and there were no physical signs that the rain was about to subside. So it was absurd that I would just go ahead and make the trip anyway that day. My route involved driving through a tunnel. Imagine my surprise when I emerged from the other end of the tunnel to find that the weather had completely reversed itself. It, 83 was bright, sunny and dry in complete contrast to the heavy torrential rains that I experienced just a few moments ago. I could hardly believe my eyes. In the part of the country where I stayed, torrential rains like this would last the whole afternoon and would fall over the whole area. But it was so surprising for me to find that this part of town was completely dry and sunny. It was a delightful realization and in that moment, I knew that the universe had just intervened on my behalf. I could connect the second event, the sunny weather after emerging from the tunnel to the first event, the inner nudge I received to start my journey. In fact, the weather was so good for me on the other side that I could park my car, 84 and run my errands in bright, abundant sunlight, without getting drenched as previously feared. I went about my affairs that day appreciating and basking in the warm sunlight, literally feeling like a million dollars. Because I went ahead with my plans trusting that the universe would respond, everything turned out well for me. Would I go as far to say that the weather patterns changed because I trusted in the universe? After all, many other factors influenced the weather, including the thoughts of other people that afternoon. All I can say is that the universe is powerful enough to make all the pieces fit together for the highest good of the observer, and everyone else. It did whatever was necessary to, 85 get me out of an unwanted and wet situation, on another level, 
This example beautifully illustrates another spiritual principle. You never know what you will get when you emerge from the other end of the tunnel. The tunnel is like a temporary reprieve from the outside world, allowing us to turn our attention away from the outside just long enough so that the universe can work its magic. In the same way, when you follow the spiritual principles outlined in this book and turn inward, you are allowing the universe the chance to work its magic and do its good. You are making space for divine interventions. This brings us to the first step of asking for divine interventions in times of personal crisis. You need to turn away from 86 reality, the issue, as it currently is. You need to enter that metaphorical tunnel that we spoke of just a few moments ago, such that you no longer know what the weather is like outside. The moment you withdraw your attention from what is bothering you, you make way for miracles to occur. Quantum physics speaks of an observer effect, where the mere observation of reality collapses the infinite possibilities into one sure version of reality. It is our continued observation of this version of reality that makes it seem so persistent. As long as our attention is fixated on the issue, reality cannot shift before our eyes because we are constantly feeding conscious intent and giving our attention to it. 87. So right now. At this every moment, turn your attention away from the perceived issue or problem. Stop thinking about it. I know this is going to be a problem at the start for most of us. Therefore, the question I usually ask is, can you let it go just for now? Adding the words just for now is important because the mind usually wants to keep thinking about a perceived problem to keep you safe. And just for now implies that you can always go back to thinking about the problem again later on if you like to. So I usually begin by asking myself, can I just put my mind somewhere else, and let go of the problem just for now? The answer will always be a yes, as I come to the realization that yes, I can always put this problem aside. 88 for a while without any consequences and think about something else. Once you have withdrawn from current, outer, Reality no matter how real it seems, I ask myself about the outcome that I want. Sometimes I am so caught up in the problem that I cannot think of an outcome. I am so paralyzed by the fear and the enormity of the issue that I am at a loss of words when trying to state what I want. Therefore, one good way is to go straight to stating the opposite. For example, if the problem is I am going to get sued in court then the opposite will be everything resolves itself for the highest good of all involved. Whatever it is, state your desired outcome in words and or pictures, in a way that is directly opposite. 89 Contrary to the problem you are facing in the first place, a blanket intention that I've used that works well for me is, everything resolves itself for the highest good of all involved in this matter. Chapter 7 The universe already knows the specifics of the outcome There is no need to go into the specifics of the solution because the universe already knows about all the specifics. The universe knows what is best for you in every case. Therefore, there is no need to worry that you are not stating the desired outcome in a detailed manner. I have found that using the blanket intention above works for all situations. 91 Because you are leaving the options open to the universe. The universe knows what is the highest good for you, although it may not be a match to what you currently perceive. Do not make the mistake of telling the universe what to do. Sometimes we can be so caught up in a particular outcome that we make use of this step to tell the universe, step by step, how we would like everything to work out. Doing so is wasting unnecessary time and effort. As I've mentioned time and time again that the universe does not need our help to sort out the details. It always knows the highest and best outcome for all involved and is ready to make it happen, if you let it. 92 The purpose of stating your intention in times of crisis is very much like going through the tunnel. It allows you to turn your attention away from your current outer reality to an alternative reality where things are going right for you where there are no problems and things have already straightened themselves out. Remember that in quantum physics, an alternative parallel reality is lived where these problems do not exist at all. These parallel realities reside alongside or even in the same space as the current reality which you are now living, 
and it is your choice which reality you would like to focus on, and this next sentence is key, you choose which reality you would like to, 93 experience through your conscious attention and focus, please be sure to read that again until you grasp the concept, you are the observer in your own quantum universe, and you choose the reality you would like to experience through your conscious attention and focus, therefore, withdraw your focus entirely from the problem. Cease to observe it at all and the problem will fall apart by its own accord. You'll be feeding no more power into the issue. Once again, this is going to be difficult for some to do. Common objections include, if I do not think about the problem, how do I solve it or the problem will not go away just because I don't think about it to that. I usually say, the problem will not go away if, 94 you keep thinking about it either. Because if you could have solved it through thinking, you would have solved it already. Chapter 8 The Golden Key Method to Immersing Yourself in the Field The final step once you have stated your desired outcome is to immerse yourself completely in this new outcome. To the exclusion of everything else, it probably takes some persistence to follow this step in the beginning, but through practice, you'll become so good that you'll sidestep problems even before they occur. 96 This is the way I live now. I hardly find myself in situations of crisis or urgent pressing problems because of my ability to focus so strongly on the intended outcome in any situation. You can do the same too, as it is just a matter of choosing what you give your attention to and withdraw your attention from. Spiritual masters throughout the ages have understood that it is probably not easy for one to completely drop the problem from their thinking and therefore have come up with the brilliant idea of replacing one thought with another. Here's how this works. Each time negative thoughts about the problem start to 97 surface in your awareness, and they will in the beginning, do not fight or resist them. The more you try to fight them, the more energy you are feeding into them. Instead, immediately replace the thought with the thought of the perfect outcome which you visualized earlier. In other words, Think of the perfect outcome and how it already exists at this very point in time and space. Spiritual teacher Emmett Fox teaches this one single principle in his short pamphlet The Golden Key, which I highly recommend and is available online for free as a public domain text. It is just two three pages, a short but profound read nonetheless. Some readers may be turned away by the religious language used, but as with any spiritual text, 98 It is important to understand the underlying essence rather than be caught up with the words used to convey that message. Emmett Fox basically teaches that whenever you feel tempted to think about a problem, stop thinking a problem and think about God instead. However, since thinking about God is not possible, it is difficult for us to form a picture of God or the universe in our mind, substitute it for some absolute statement of truth that appeals to you. What the author is saying is to interpret the universe in a way that is relatable to you right now. A few of the statements suggested include there is no power but God. I am the child of God, filled and surrounded by the perfect peace of God. Alternatively, the 99 earlier affirmation which I provided works just as well. Everything is now working out for the highest good of all involved. Let's go beyond the language and words used to the underlying essence of this spiritual principle. What one is really doing when they turn away from the problem is not escaping from the problem. There is a difference between escapism and an application of universal laws. In the former, you do not believe that the problem can be solved and you run away from it. In the latter, you know deep within yourself that the problem is solved, and therefore you let it go. The difference is in one's inner state. Spiritual understanding means to show such a deep sense of faith and trust in the universe that you 100 consider the problem already completely resolved, as if there is not a problem in the first place, you are placing your utmost attention on an alternative reality where the problem does not exist, with each choice we make, we branch off into an alternate reality and into more and more alternative realities, for each choice that we make. There exists realities for the other choices we did not make. Therefore, despite whatever happened that created the problem you are perceiving now, know that there exists alternate realities where the problem does not even exist in the first place. 
Know that divine perfection always exists at every point in time and space, and that this possibility of perfection is right. 101 here, right now, choose to focus on the perfection that already exists as a potentiality and you will bring it into fruition. Focus so completely on it to the exclusion of everything else. Each time thoughts about the problem gently flow back into your mind. Replace it immediately with thoughts of complete and divine universal perfection. These statements of truth may help. Everything resolves itself for the highest good of all involved. The perfect outcome happens right now for the highest good of all involved. There is no problem in divine mind. There is no lack in divine mind. It is done. 102 I leave everything to the universe. The universe is taking care of everything. In using any of the statements above, know that it is not the mere words used but the feelings those words help to develop within you. Therefore, feel free to use your own statements if necessary. We are not concerned about the words used, but rather the feeling evoked by those words. Use words that soothe and feel good to you, that evoke deep within you the feeling of peace and settlement. In fact, it would be useful to think back to a time when you settled what you considered to be a big issue. Perhaps you, 103 were going on a vacation and finally had everything planned out and your tickets booked. Recall the sense of relief satisfaction you felt as everything fell into place. Recall the sense of assurance you had. This sense of assurance is what we are looking for right now, and you can easily bring it into your present moment. While using any of the statements above, simultaneously feel that deep sense of assurance and immerse yourself in that feeling. Stay there with it. Each time thoughts about the problem come up for you, and they may resurface a few times during the day. Repeat the statement and feel that deep sense of assurance again. Keep doing this and you'll notice a few things. 1. Fear worry thoughts don't crop. 104 up as much for you anymore. You begin to loosen your grip on the problem, and the problem begins to loosen its grip over you, and, too, the problem, more often than not, resolves itself on its own accord, without the need for any intervention on your part. In all the times I have tried these techniques, I would say that the problem straightened itself out around 90% of the time without any active intervention on my part. The circumstances changed such that I no longer needed to solve the problem anymore, or that there was nothing else for me to do. In the remaining 10% of the time, I would receive impulses and nudges as I was going about my daily routine on a person to approach, or a way to bring the matter to its 105 needed closure. I have experienced success each time I followed those inner nudges. One thing I am sure of is that I would never have been able to come up with those solutions on my own if I kept mulling over the problem and letting my own fear overwhelm me. The solutions that were given to me involved taking some kind of unexpected, but not drastic, action that usually eluded me as I was so consumed by the problem. However looking back in hindsight, they turned out to be the best option I could have taken to resolve the issue in the first place. I encourage you to try this method out for yourself, and to be persistent at it. Really decide that you want to be free of one drama, 106 after another in your life. Resolve to live with a deep sense of faith, trust and assurance, and the above will work unfailingly for you every single time. Chapter 9 Resist the Urge to Check Reality Many years ago, I attended a Hopanapano seminar conducted by Hawaiian spiritual healer Dr. Ihalikala Hugh Len, whose work has since been made famous in the book Zero Limits by Dr. Joe Vital. It was fascinating to learn about the Hawaiian spiritual healing tradition at the workshop and to be able to meet the master himself. Without getting into the specifics of this Hawaiian spiritual healing tradition, one 108 thing that Dr. Hugh Len said at the seminar stuck with me. We must resist the urge to check reality each time we engage in some kind of spiritual practice. What Dr. Hugh Len meant by this statement is that after we have done a particular process, or followed a particular series of steps in order to invoke a specific outcome, we must resist the urge to check if things have indeed changed. We must let go and allow the universe the space to work its magic. Thinking about this from a quantum physics perspective makes a lot of sense. 
Recall from the previous chapter that if you keep your attention fixated on reality, then reality cannot change while you are looking at it. Your very observance of reality and 109 Your conscious awareness of it is keeping things in their old, stuck state. Thus, one key is to take your attention away from reality for a moment. If you are successful in doing so, even for a brief moment, you'll find the most miraculous things start happening in life for you. There actually is a logical explanation behind all this. When we stop getting so fixated about the way things currently are, we stop feeding our energy into the situation. The energy, which we are indirectly supplying to the situation through our continued attention on it, is keeping everything stagnant in its place. In the words of Abraham Hicks which portray this so beautifully, everything is changing to the same reality, 110 over and over again. In other words, while it may seem as if things are not changing for you, they are actually changing but to the same thing over and over again. Realizing this truth is power for you, since you now have the power to change things such that they do not become the same thing over and over again. You now have the power to choose a new reality, therefore the most difficult part in all of this is not really the asking part. We are always asking through the course of our lives, and when we state intentions and affirmations, the most difficult part I have is to resist the urge to check physical reality. The great spiritual teacher Emmett Fox has taught us a way to circumvent this. Sheridan, 111 The Last Chapter which is to immediately replace our thoughts of the problem, current physical reality, with the thoughts of God, a symbol for our desired reality. This thought substitution is a very effective approach that can work. Whenever you feel an urge to check whether things have changed on the outside, refrain from doing so and instead repeat a statement of truth that evokes deep feelings of peace and assurance within you. The statement I like to use is, it is done. The universe is taking care of it, therefore, I see no further need to check on the issue to see if it has been resolved. Lead the timing and mode of divine interventions to the universe and do your work. Immerse yourself in the joyfulness of 112 Daily Life, in the activities that you already do daily. If you have done the preparatory work outlined in the earlier chapters, you'll put yourself in a very conducive state to receive divine intervention. You'll also receive a clear signal, in the form of a feeling, when a divine intervention occurs in your life. Again, the details of each intervention is personal and only you will know it when it happens. As always, it is a good idea to keep these interventions to yourself to free yourself from the expectations of others. Chapter 10 The 95-5 Code to Divine Interventions The way to divine interventions is not to dial 911 but surprisingly to dial 955. What I'm about to share in this chapter is the 95-5 code to allowing divine interventions. When you understand the significance of the numbers 95-5, you would have grasped a very key piece of the puzzle. The 95-5 rule applies to almost every single thing you identify as a problem or issue in your life. 95 refers to the 95% of the time in our lives where we receive absolutely 114 no physical signs of the problem. Let me explain. For most perceived problems in our lives, we are not reminded of the problem 95% of the time. Instead, it is only 5% of the time where we receive some physical signs or reminders of the issue. What do I mean by this? Let's take for example a perceived problem with one's finances. Suppose the problem is that you do not have enough money. If you really look at when you receive physical reminders and signals about the existence of this problem, you'll realize something very interesting, which is, you only know it when you need to settle your bills or make a payment. It is only in those moments when you may be 115 reminded of the fact that you do not have enough money. However, for the remainder of your time, I would say more than 95% of your day, the problem does not exist in your physical reality. The only reason why it remains at the foreground of your awareness is because of thoughts and memories replaying in your head. Those are your representations of reality and your constant reminders to yourself about the financial situation, but they are not physical phenomenon presenting itself to you. 
Once you understand the distinction between actual physical phenomenon presenting itself to you, versus your thoughts reminding yourself about 116 reality, you will be able to reap the rewards of these teachings very fast. The secret is to distinguish between when the moments are merely thinking about a problem, versus when you are actually physically reminded about the problem. The former 95% of the time when you are thinking about a problem can be completely eliminated. If you do so, you'll be making space for divine interventions to occur in your life. Examine how many times a day you are unavoidably reminded of some unwanted situation. I would guess that if you add those moments up, they would only amount to a few minutes a day. Of course, if your 117 creditors are harassing you, then you would be reminded each time they do so, in which case I recommend that you work out an arrangement to reduce such instances. Whatever it is, we first want to keep physical reminders of current reality, that 5% to a minimum. This may entail, as I suggested above, working out an arrangement with other parties such that you do not get reminded so often. Also, if you have physical objects around the house that remind you of the actual physical situation, remove them, take them out of sight. Once again using the example of an unwanted financial situation, I would not keep my bills lying around in plain sight. Anything that you can see and focus, 118 your attention on even momentarily demands that you give some thought to that object, hence, remove any objects in your immediate surroundings that are not pleasant to you. Let me take you through how I do this. I do not leave my bills carelessly lying around, even though I pay them promptly, in full and on time. All of them go into a folder when they arrive in the mail, and I don't even look at what is inside that folder except once a month when I sit down to pay my bills. I recommend that you do the same too. I am surprised by the number of people who plaster their bills all over their workstation and keep it up on their notice boards at home or work. They are afraid of being laid on, 119 those payments, and hence keep it in front of them as constant reminders. My advice is to set up a monthly schedule, once or twice a month to pay your bills. I do mine once on the 30th or 31st of each month. I have chosen this timing after studying the due dates of all my bills, which are usually due by the first week of the following month. Hence paying them at that point in the month ensures that I am on time. For the rest of the month, I do not look at the bills or even think about them. If you are worried about forgetting to pay or how to pay, write a post-it and paste it on your notice board. One post-it note is better than a whole board or letter holder filled with bills. Chapter 11 Creating Your Own Conducive Quantum Universe I decorate my surroundings with stuff that is pleasing to me. There is a school of thought that you feed your subconscious mind with whatever is plastered all around you and hence we have to be careful with what we allow the subconscious to take in. I believe that the actual logic is even simpler than that. Each time you look at something, you are forced to give it some of your attention whether you like it or not. Therefore you 121 are forced to think about those bills each time your eyes meet them, regardless of how little brain time you give them. Why not devote your brain time to better stuff? That's why I decorate my room and workspace with pleasing stuff to me. I remove any items that will cause unhappy or unwanted thoughts in me the moment I look at them. No matter how fleeting these thoughts may be, is social media negatively conditioning you? The same also applies to the use of social media and Facebook. In this day and age, we all have to engage in the use of social media to keep in touch with family and friends. However, one of my pet peeves, 122 about social media is the use of it to perpetuate negative or fear-based messages. What I do then, is to set up my social media, and devices, such that I do not receive any of these negative messages in my newsfeed. I hide messages from friends who are perpetually negative, and even remove them if I have to. Again. Not so much of what I am feeding my subconscious but because each time I read those messages and see those photographs, I have to spend some time and effort to process them. I have friends who like to share photos and set stories about disasters, injustice, cases of abuse happening all over the country world. 
I have removed them from my list because we really do not need to be exposed to any more negativity that is, 123 around us, in every moment, we can always choose where to turn our attention to, what I have done instead is to fill my social media with positive and uplifting messages, and of the things I like, after a few tries, my new feed now fills my day with positive and empowering messages. I subscribe to the messages from all my favorite authors, and they usually fill my news feed with wonderful quotes, inspirational stories and breathtaking scenery throughout the day. Now I feel good about using social media. I recently subscribed to the feed of a spiritual author but after a few days, I realized that every other message was a veiled complaint about what was wrong with our system and the need to change it. I removed her from my... 124 feet immediately, the true power of the internet, not unlike the law of attraction, is that in every moment, you always have the ability to choose what you want to look at, one of my friends once reasoned that she is trying to raise awareness by publicizing cases of animal abuse on her feet, I am not sure if she was successful, but she certainly made a lot of people sad first, I also fill my social media with news about my happy hobbies, these are subjects that I feel good about, so now, instead of reading the news and feeling drained throughout the day, I actually feel so happy and energized when I check my social media updates. This is a quick fix which you can do starting today which I strongly recommend. 125 Although it may take a week or two before you finally start seeing everything lined up positively in your news feed, the changes in your consciousness will be profound though. No. Herein lies a very useful metaphor to our real lives, at the beginning without any conscious effort or control, our news feed, mind chatter, is filled with mostly negative and unwanted stuff, however, after some conscious effort through pruning and weeding, we end up with mostly positive, uplifting news throughout the day, when you reach that state, you'll find that miracles happen for you often, and very quickly, one of the most common objections I get is, if I block everything out, how do I keep tabs on what is happening out there? 126 My response would be, why would you even need to? I work with some very smart and successful people in the course of my work, and never once have I been put down because I did not keep tabs on the latest horrendous events happening around the world. Most of our discussion is uplifting and professional, focused on the important matters at hand. In the one occasion someone asked whether I had heard about that particular case at a party, I politely replied that I had not and the individual filled me in on it, after which I politely changed the subject, therefore do not worry about not appearing worldly or sophisticated enough if you do not have a ready answer to everything that is happening in the world today, everyone who has a ready answer probably got it from, 127 someone else on social media anyway. What is more important is your own inner state, would you rather be an effective manifester, living a life of miracles and magic or someone who knows all about the miseries of others, the same applies to physical items as well, whenever I see any trinkets that make me feel good, I'll buy them even if they are a bit expensive by conventional standards, the value you derive from looking at that item will far outweigh what you have paid for it. Just yesterday I was shopping and came across these incredibly beautiful 3D photo frames that create the illusion of the photograph floating within the frame. They were several times more expensive than 128 conventional photo frames, but I was so enamored by the effect that I stood in the store staring at it for well over 10 minutes. I know I would have many hours of delight and fun with them at home as well, which is why I bought a few eventually. The photo frame is now sitting nicely on my cabinet, and I feel so happy each time I look at it. You can never put a monetary value on the energetic value of things. With a little creative thinking, you can greatly amplify the good feeling thoughts which you feel throughout the day, hence reaping maximum benefits from the law of attraction. Another more expensive than usual purchase I made was for some nice pajamas with funny prints. It would certainly seem. 129 silly to pay more than a hundred dollars for pajamas, especially for grown-ups, but I have received more than my money's worth, it feels so luxurious and I feel so happy each time I wear them, 
the joy makes me feel like a kid again. The feeling of well-being and joy is just indescribable when I look at those funny prints, especially since I work mostly from home and wear them around the place most of the time. Even as I write this, dollar for dollar, it would be hard to justify spending my money on something else that does not give me as much satisfaction and happiness. I am bringing this example up not to advocate the mindless buying of expensive things, but to illustrate that with a little, 130 thought and planning, your dollars can go a long way towards making you feel better. Feeling better is what you should always aim for, especially if you would like to welcome more magic and miracles in your life. On the flip side, I once bought a cheap pair of shoes that were on discount, thinking that I have saved myself more than a few dollars. Sure, the thought of saving money made me quite pleased for a while. Unfortunately, the shoes turned out to be poorly made or factory rejects which is probably why they were discounted in the first place, and I ended up cursing each time I wore them. The joy of whatever money I saved was taken away by the fact that I devoted much of my attention to complaining about those shoes each time I wore them. Is that worth it? Now that you... 131 Know the energetic and immense power of our thoughts. I think the answer is clear. Before adding more stuff, one thing you can do is to remove items from your surrounding that remind you of unwanted outcomes or events. Are there items related to an old relationship which you wish to move on from? If so, put the item out of sight or give it away. Remember that each time you look at it, you are giving attention to it and hence remaining stuck in the old energetic patterns. Remove clutter from your environment as that usually creates a sense of overwhelmment or obligation to do something about the mess. Unless of course you feel alright about the clutter. 132 If you follow the tips above, what would happen is that you will create a safe and comforting environment for yourself right at home or in the office. Everything in the environment would nurture and support you each time you looked at it. You would feel happy to be in that space as well. Not only would you be more productive and energetic, you can rest in the assurance that whatever you ask for will come more quickly as well. It is always easier to ask for something when there are no objects in the surrounding draining you of precious energy. I guess the short way of summarizing everything I have said is this. Don't allow your environment to physically remind you of any of your issues. On the contrary, you, 133 want your environment to match your desired future and outcome, to make you feel inspired and safe. I prefer my environment to be uplifting, decorating it with inspirational quotes and calendars. At the same time, I keep the decorations light and try not to go overboard with them. If you really follow the steps above, you'll feel lighter and more positive within a day or two. More importantly, you would have cut out everything in your physical world that reminds you about the problems. If there are unhappy emails that remind you of issues at work or unhappy messages, delete or at least hide them. There is an option in Gmail to archive messages. Why see them each time you access your 134 inbox and be reminded of them? There is certainly no value in that. Talking about something you do not want, or complaining about things to others is another sure way to perpetuate an unwanted reality. Remove anything which you do not wish to see from your surroundings. There is a mistaken belief that you need to be reminded to safeguard yourself against the same situation or prevent the problem from happening again. But by now you should understand why it is more valuable to just get everything out of sight. Instead of being bogged down by the past memory of it, you can do this no matter what circumstances you face in your life right now. 135 Structure your life and surrounding such that you are reminded of unwanted things as little as possible, and focus your attention entirely on something else. With just this step alone you will find the external circumstances greatly improved. Because from the moment you turn your attention away from what is unwanted onto something wanted, you are giving the universe the muck needed space to work its magic. Try it. You'll be surprised by how much the universe can do even if you turn away from the perceived issue only momentarily. That small gap is all the universe needs. With each small success you experience, you'll gain the confidence to turn away from an unwanted reality more and more.
136 until finally one day, you'll be able to drop a perceived problem at a moment's notice and not even worry a single bit about it, because the universe would be so ready to intervene at your behalf. Chapter 12 Get Busy Starting Happy Things When I look back at the things I have achieved in my life and the various milestones I have reached in my career, I wouldn't say that they all fell into my lap without me having to do anything to achieve them. Obviously, I had to engage myself in the necessary physical action in order to bring about the desired outcomes. However, the whole process wasn't one of struggle or hard work for me. I enjoyed every single moment of it, even when it appeared I was just doing mundane work on the outside. When 138 you immerse yourself in the field of infinite possibilities and allow yourself to be led along each step of the way, hard work doesn't even feel like work at all. Instead, it simply feels like the next logical progression and the next logical step. You will receive impulses on what to do next and you will intuitively know what is the next best thing to do. Perhaps the best way I can explain this is in terms of writing my books. When I write any of my books, I always start the writing project not knowing how it will turn out, or how it will end. The principles here apply not just to writing a book, but to any endeavor in life. Very often I start with an idea, a hunch that I receive, which I then develop into a book title. Bear in mind that that 139 this point, I only have a vague idea of the central theme and what I would like to convey in the book, but I go ahead and get a cover designed for the book anyway, as if it is already finished. When the cover is done up by the designer, I set the cover up on my workspace as if the book is already completed and then proceed to write the book. I write the book with the feeling that the book is already completed, and that it already exists somewhere in the field. Now I just have to get it out of me in written form. When I use this method, I find that the books write themselves effortlessly and there is no strain or struggle in the process at all. I know many authors who struggle with writer's block, taking many months or even years to get a piece of work out. But an understanding of this, 140 spiritual principle sidesteps these issues completely. These principle can be applied to other areas of your life too. Instead of waiting for everything to be shown to you and the whole road map to be laid out in front of your eyes, which it will never be, start with the presumption that the whole project is already complete. While you may not have the actual information you need to fill in all the pieces, what we are going for here is a feeling. All you need is just a feeling that the entire endeavor is complete, and it is all that you need. Recall how I made my journey despite the heavy rain. In my mind the journey was already complete, I just had to make it, and the same goes for the rest of us, each, 141 and every day of our lives, if you even have an inkling of a project or business you would like to start, do it, treat it as complete and immerse yourself completely in the field, you will receive all the guidance, intervention and inspiration you need to carry your ideas to fruition, when I look back at the end of a project, I am often surprised by how productive I was, or by all the things that came out of it. If I were to sit down right at the beginning and write a checklist of all the things to do, I would most certainly be too discouraged to start. Perhaps the universe knows this and feeds us ideas only one step at a time. As each step is completed, we elevate our consciousness just enough to attract receive. 142 The next piece of the puzzle and the next piece, and so on. So this goes back to a core principle we were discussing earlier in the book. Don't sit around waiting for signs and signals. Don't sit around waiting for divine interventions. Get busy. Get busy immersing yourself wholeheartedly in your daily activities, no matter how mundane they may seem for you at the beginning. Sometimes the problem or issue seems so overwhelming that the fear paralyzes you. But the more you allow yourself to remain in an action, the most you are reinforcing this stuck state of things. So get busy and do something. If you really have nothing to do, engage yourself in some mundane activity like clearing out your 143 surroundings. Engaging in these mundane activities can be a very good form of distraction to quieten your mind chatter and allow you to create a void. 
where you momentarily turn your focus away from the problems at hand. The whole key to allowing magic and miracles in your life is to create a void to welcome them in. This void is created when you somehow manage to take your mind off the problem, even for a little while. For people who are not aware of these spiritual principles, they are unwilling to do so, since they have a mistaken belief that they need to keep thinking about a problem in order to solve it, or have not trained themselves to be able to do so. Thus they see no alternative other, 144 than to continue being trapped by dead end thinking of the problem. But as a reader of this book, you now know better, you know, counterintuitively, that the way to solve any problem is to stop thinking about it and create a gap that allows the universe to step in and intervene. That is all you have to do. If you want to go one step further, then it is to stop reminding yourself about the problem by removing all physical reminders and signs of the problem from your physical reality. You may find that in just a short time, things in your external circumstances would have changed so drastically that you wonder if the problem was truly as serious in the first place. That's one of the many miraculous results often reported. The 145 problems straightened itself out so miraculously that they think they must have made a mistake in assessing the problem in the first place. But the truth is simple. It is their perceptions which changed, leading to a change in outside circumstances. Most people never try out this counterintuitive way of living, and hence miss out on the immense benefits of having life work this way for them. They insist on solving problems the old-fashioned way, using their own intellect and rationalization. Sadly, most people do not manage to do so, and end up leading unhappy and dissatisfied lives. It is easy to see why, when you perceive yourself to be in a situation that has no tenable solution. It is like a prisoner, 146 sentence to a life sentence with nowhere to turn, yet that is not how our life supporting universe is constructed, the universe is designed to support our well-being and to be life sustaining, whatever we ask for, the universe responds and delivers it to us, the universe handles this part of the equation so well, so that we can focus on doing our part, which is to decide what we want and create wisely. Chapter 13 You never know a miracle in advance You would not know in advance when you will experience a miracle. If you do, is it still a miracle? You'll only know when the subsequent events take place, which allows you to connect the dots and draw the linkages to earlier events. Hence I would not spend my time looking out for signs of a miracle. Doing so will be counterproductive. Instead, just let your life as per normal and the universe will intervene when necessary and when you allow it the space to follow the steps outlined in this book and withdraw 148 or focus from reality, especially if things do not please you. Replace negative thoughts with positive thoughts of things that you like as often as possible. There are times where the universe has to take a slightly longer route to deliver something to you, and it may not be through the means you expect. However, if you adopt the right frame of mind and right spirit, the weight will not seem to be grueling at all. Instead, it will all seem very natural to you. I would like to end with another story. There was once I had the intention of ordering a pair of prescription eyeglasses online. However, I would need detailed information. 149 regarding my prescriptions to do so, which I did not have. Just the other day. I received a call from an old friend out of the blue, he's a medical doctor training to be an eye specialist and asked if I would allow him to perform a free eye check on me, as he had some specialist examinations to clear, I agreed and to my delight, he was able to give me detailed information about my eyeglasses and my prescription, never in a hundred years would I have expected the information to fall into my lap so easily, and through such harmonious means. My earlier concerns about having to ask an optician for this information dissolved of its own accord. 150 It wasn't until I sat down and pondered this incident that I understood its significance. My friend did not contact me by accident. My friend contacted me and requested for my favor because the universe must have nudged him in some way, knowing that I had made an earlier intention to gain access to my prescription. 
Can you see how the universe always works in miraculous ways? When you state an intention or request, the universe always answers. But how it answers and how it delivers what you ask for is not up to your control. Simply because there are so many possibilities and factors that we can easily overlook. I would certainly not have imagined the prescription coming to me through an eye doctor. 151 In the same way, the universe can intervene for you in miraculous ways. Leave it to do its magic and let it do so. Immerse yourself in the joyful attitude of not worrying about how something will come to you. If worry thoughts come into your mind during the course of the day, gently let them go by substituting it with a positive thought of the issue already resolved in the way you want it to. See the outcome as already coming to pass right now. Do this as many times as necessary to counter the emotional charge of the worry thoughts, and soon you'll find that the worry thoughts fade into the background and hardly become an issue anymore. As mentioned at the start of this book, I have gone down to just one or two worry thoughts a day which I instantly let go of, as compared, 152 to incessant worrying in the past, the worry is what stops you from experiencing your good in your lives, I'm not telling you here to stop worrying immediately, it would be impossible for anyone to do so, if their mind obeyed their bidding, then I would only have to tell myself to stop worrying once and everything would be alright, instead, Allow yourself to continue worrying but deal with these worried thoughts as they come up. As these worried thoughts appear, do not fight them. Instead, acknowledge them and ask yourself if you want to consciously believe in them. You can worry all you want all day, but if you stop believing in those thoughts, the worrying would have no effect on 153 you at all. In time to come. If you stop believing in those worrisome thoughts and stopped allowing yourself to be led down the path by them, your mind will see the futility in worrying and stop sending you those thoughts because you no longer derive any payoff from them. This is the reason why worry thoughts don't even float into my consciousness nowadays. I don't entertain or believe in them in the first place. Now some people may say, oh but this is only an exercise, if I don't worry. It does not mean bad things will not happen. However, this reasoning violates the very powerful law of attraction in our universe. By believing in negative thoughts, one is feeding more thought energy into them. 154 and hence making the attraction of that outcome almost a certainty. By doing the opposite and not entertaining those thoughts, you are refusing to feed any energy to an unwanted reality. And because you absolutely refuse to give it any attention, there is no way something can happen in your experience. Try it for yourself. It will take only one or two instances for the validity of these universal laws to be apparent to yourself. The very first time you start living this way and following the practices in this book, it may seem as if nothing has happened. Life may still seem to be the same for you, but keep at it. Keep feeling different. Keep adhering to the practices in this book to the stubborn exclusion of everything else. Soon, you'll find things starting to change and the good you've always desired start to flow into your life. In fact, it is my absolute promise that they'll start flowing so fast and fabulously that you'll be stumped. You'll wonder what has happened to cause all this change in your life, and whether your lucky stars have suddenly lined themselves up. I am reminded at this juncture of a popular quote from the play Julius Caesar by Shakespeare, The fault is not in our stars, but in ourselves. How apt this saying is once you understand how the universe works, you are now free from any and all external circumstances, for you now know that the reality you experience is entirely up to your own awareness, as it always has been and always will be. You are now free to allow miracles in your life, and it is so.